also to the ambassador Ghana. Let us pray. Father, we worship your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for your presence today in every home, in every setting where your people have gone to this morning. Father, as we are about to go into your word, the Bible says that the entrance of your word giveth light. Father, we ask, O oh Lord, that your light will come into every act through your word in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we are in the love moment. And, uh, we are in the new year. I hope we are enjoying God's presence already this year. Last week, as a recap, we studied practical love in marriage and we looked at two key components or two key types of love. We looked at the storage, which was described as the affectionate love, the love that goes around in family, the love that God described as such that will not make a mother to abandon the child. And we look at the highest form of love, which is the sacrificial love of God, which is called agape love. And we say that if every other form of love give way, agape love will definitely not. So as a believer, we are supposed to possess agape love towards each other. Today we want to look at another in our marriage and our family series, another lesson today, today being the 13th of January. The topic for today is love dynamic in marriage. Love dynamic in marriage. We are going to read from the book of Genesis as our Bible passage. Genesis chapter 2 from verse 18 to 25. Genesis chapter 2 from verse 18 to 25. And I read, And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone, I will make him an help meet. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave name to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an earth meat for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh under the earth. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man, and his, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, that they sh shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. One key thing we are going to see from this scripture is that marriage is the making of God. Marriage is the institution of God. If you look at the text we have read and we want to review it, the first, first thing we are going to see is that everything about marriage started by God. God himself started it. From the first 18 of the Genesis 2 we have read, God started by identifying that there is a gap in the life of the man called Adam. And God felt that there is a need for him to bring the complement that is called an meat, not a substitute, not something that he can just manage or play around with, but something that makes him complete, something without which is not complete. And that became somebody that is called a woman and the wife. Praise the Lord. Another thing we are going to see here is that God organized it. Look at how God went through it. Thank God for the Bible, and it's the basis of the science and surgery today. God was the first surgeon here. He organized things to make sure that he gets the right woman, the right person, 
that fits in, that complements Adam so that he can fulfill purpose and be fulfilled. That's in Genesis 2.21. Now, we've talked about the surgery and we've seen how God translated a bone from the rib of a man into another creature called woman. The good news today is that for all of us that are married, you need to know that that your spouse is part of you. That your spouse is God designed for you, from you. And for all of us that are trusting God also to be married, just know that God has a special design for you in a man and in a woman. And that is what made the person to be your bone of bone and your flesh of flesh. Now, there is one key thing we are going to see here, the harmony. There was a perfect harmony in everything that the Lord did here. Be it from the fact that they come together when they identify each other, they live together, they were not ashamed. And they could leave every other thing just to be together. So there's a perfect unity, there's a perfect harmony in the marriage that God originally designed. Praise the Lord. Today we are going to look at two lesson outlines. And I have in the house here, also with me, Pastor Nii Oju Olape, who is going to be a co-teacher in today's class. So I'm going to take the first outline. And the first outline says, Scriptural Principles Guiding Marriage. Are there principles that God has put in place that guide marriage? The answer is yes. And one key thing we know by law and principle is that principles are fundamental. They don't change. What changes is method. So a lot of us that might have been confused on how to go about it, I pray that the Holy Spirit will open our heart today as we learn this principle and God will put us through in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the very first principle we want to bring out from God's word is that we, ourselves, and the couple, male and female, they are made in the image of God. So, there is a basis for God to say that I'm going to make an ethnic for you. Why? Because you are in my image. Because man is in the image of God, God knows what is best for us. And whatever God has designed for us, being in his image is just nothing but perfect. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it establishes the fact that we, as human beings, a male and a female, we are made as God's image. And if God, in whose image we are made, designs marriage for us originally, then that means that it is a perfect design. It is an original design. And there cannot be anything to counter what God himself, who created us, and designed for us. Praise the Lord. So we need to have that, knowing that as an image of God, wherever God has put in our origin, as originator of marriage, is a perfect thing. Praise the Lord. Now, the next thing we need to know here, from the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, which we have read, in where God identified the fact that Adam was not perfect. God made a woman to compliment him. But the woman was not exactly like the man. The woman has a lot of features that are different from what Adam has as his own feature. And we are teaching here today that as a biblical principle, every differences that are in the two sexes, both male and female, they are both designed and they are complementary and not competitive. There are a lot of school of thoughts on compatibility in marriage. A lot of people have said that, okay, if you are not compatible, don't go together. A lot of people have said, okay, if you are not compatible, that's the reason why you must come together, because you bring contrast into play. But the key thing is that man is made one way, a woman is made another way. A woman is not a substitute. Rather, she's the completeness of a man. That's why the Bible called her and earth meets. 
an earth that is fit, an earth that is accurate, an earth that complements, that makes a perfection. Therefore, every differences we see today, they are actually supposed to be blessing. They are actually supposed to be what brings pleasure, what brings goodness, what brings enjoyment, what brings fulfillment, what makes it whole, complete. It's like you having two sides of a coin. Now, there's a side we call the head, there's another side we call the tail. Now, if you put the image on the head to the tail, you know that nobody's going to accept that because the coin doesn't look like a complete one. And if you change the tail also for the head, same thing. But when the two are combined, then the coin is complete. So neither the head is a substitute to the tail, or the tail is a substitute to the head. Rather, they are complementary. So everything God has made in us, as a woman, as a man, they are distinctively made to complement one another. And it should be our basis for unity. It should be our basis for togetherness. It should be our basis never to create segregation. Praise the Lord. The third principle that we want to examine this morning is that marriage is a divine institution and that it is a relationship of companionship. If we look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 to 25, we have read. And if we look at Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, if you look at verse 5, Matthew chapter 19, verse 5, Jesus Christ was talking to us and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. Now, it is key for us to know that there is companionship here. A lot of people are married today and they are married into isolation. A lot of people are married today and their marriage is as if they are single, they are un 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 unmarried. Why? Because there is no companionship. There is no engagement. If you look at the word of the Lord Jesus Christ there, in the book of Matthew chapter 5, I read again. He said, and shall cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. So the twain shall interact. The twain shall keep each other's company. The twain shall develop companionship such a way that they are inseparable. That is the purpose and the will of God. If you are married today and you are still lonely, you need to check this scripture. I need to check where you are missing it. Are you engaging well in the marriage? Are you a companion of each other. These are the original principle and original design that God made. And we need to restore that one to enjoy the fruitfulness in marriage. Praise the Lord. The principle number four that I want to look at is that marriage was designed by God to be a permanent, mutual, and covenant relationship. Marriage is not like a contract that you can resign or like a contract that you can tear off. As a matter of fact, marriage certificate does not have an expiry date. It is till death do us part in all condition, all terrain, all weather, all situation. You don't enter a marriage as a trial relationship. No. You don't enter a marriage to see if it will work. No. As soon as you are entering the marriage, you know that you are in a permanent relationship. Marriage is like being born. When you are being born, you are not like, okay, let me come to the world to do a trial and see if I can go back and reborn again. No. You are in the world already. And what do you do? You are climatized. What do you do? You are just. What do you do? You get used to what the world is and you grow into it to make a living, to make a life, and to make it, I mean, comfortable for you. Now, the same thing in marriage. There's nothing like looking back. There's nothing like, let's put it on a trial. There's nothing like, let's see how it goes. It is that once you are in it, make it better. 
Once you are in it, make it good. And remember, it's a covenanted relationship. And God Almighty Himself is the covenant maker. And that's what the Bible says that whatsoever God has joined together, that is Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. I read. He said, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no man put asunder means no man, including you, the husband. No man or no woman, including you, the wife. So nobody must put marriage asunder because it is the covenant of God. It is an act of God. It is what God made. So we must accept it, nurture it, grow it, and make sure that we get fulfilled in it. Praise the Lord. The principle number five we want to look at is the intention of God. That God's intent is for marriage to be an inestimable source of joy and fulfillment. We are not married to grudge. We are not married to manage ourselves. We are not married to like struggle. We are married to enjoy fulfillment. We are married to have joy, abundant joy, unspeakable joy. And I'm praying today that any one of us hearing me that is challenged, especially in the area of joy at home, God will restore your joy like joy of salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, another point which we need to discuss in the principle is that through marriage, God intends to bring redemption to human race. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God told the woman, I'm going to put an enmity between you and the snake, the serpent, and I'm going to work a redemption back to you. And Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, the Bible said that through our seed, through the seed of a woman, the entire world will be blessed. So, through marriage, <coughs> God intends to bring redemption to human race. And the last point there is that marital relationship provides vehicle for incarnation of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, 31 to 32. Let's read. <coughs> I read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his wife. Third time we are reading this. For a man leave his father and mother. And shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning the Christ and the church. For I three. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife, see that she references her husband. For I two told us. That there's a mystery here. Through marriage, a vehicle is provided to bring the Lord Jesus Christ into our generation. And I pray that as we ride on this vehicle of marriage, Christ shall be enthroned in our generation in the name of Jesus Christ. Now we have the class activity here, which we are going to take briefly. That is, we are going to combine it with second class activity after Pastor Nia has taken the lesson at line two. The activity says, discuss why marriage, many marriages do not follow or are not based on the above principle that we have examined. I would like to call on Pastor Nee to take the second outline, understanding the love language. God bless you. Thank you very much, my brother. Um, we're going to be taking the second lesson outline, the title is... Um, is still understanding the love language, understanding the love language, and I take it from where he has taught. And um, this is a very simple, straightforward one 
we're going to be having um, discussions about for uh, the issue of for a, for a lasting marriage. What should couples what should couples do? What is love language? These are the things that we need to understand. And we we are meant to understand that couples should understand and uh, apply what is called the love language frequently in order for them to have uh, a good life. In order for everybody to be able to understand. Uh, my dear, um, as we have been, as we have heard, um, there are principles based on which the marriage will work. What is the love language? The first time, the first thing we want to talk about is uh, quality time together. A couple that does not spend time together, they are not fulfilling marriage in the way in which it should be. Um, this, uh, quality, quality time together means being together all the time, being together many times because. The essence of marriage is for them to be together. Even God was coming to meet together. When they left man together, he said, the two shall become one. And then in, um, in order to look at it, let us see what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 26, verse 8. Genesis 26, verse 8. Um, what the Bible says there is that... Um, it, the, the Bible says that an Esau seen that the daughter of Cana pleased not Isaac his father and means that anyway the what what the Bible means or what we are made to understand is that for us to have um, for couples to enjoy their life for them to have fun well, it's not just only when they are celebrating birthdays or when they are doing um, anything in particular anniversaries that people should um, talk to talk to each other or to spend time together. Couples must take time out to spend time together. That is the first one. Then there is what is called the act of service. It's another major, um, major type of love language. This type of love, love language is what's called act of service. It means that you should do things that your spouse would like you to do. Things that are able in normal household jobs. If we are encouraged to, to, to help our spouses to do what the spouse wants. It's another is another love language. It strengthens and bonds relationship. In Exodus chapter four verse nine, the Bible says that Exodus chapter four verse nine, the Bible says that two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. So when the two together are doing things together, when they are doing acts of service together, it encourages um, them. Then there is a third love language that we like to quickly look at, which is exchange of gifts. Exchange of gifts, even for those who are not couples. People are required to exchange gifts as a sign of respect, as a sign of love. So how much more couples? So when you have a couple, when they exchange gifts regularly, when they, it's not don't just wait for the birthday or the anniversary in order to exchange gifts. No matter how small it is, um, whatever whatever it will take, it we, are, we, are, we encourage couples to uh, to exchange gifts, and it shows that you are thinking of your spouse. Every other time. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. We see there an example in which Anna gave a worthy portion. I mean, Anna was given a worthy portion because, because the Bible says that for he loved Anna. Verse, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says, But unto Anna he gave a worthy portion for he loved Anna, but the Lord has shut up a womb. That's um, the husband gave something to the wife. It's a very good, it's a very good language of love. The fourth one that we talk about is words of affirmation. Words of affirmation in your daily in your daily interaction all the time, there is always the need to speak out. There's always the need to speak out in order for your for, for your partner or for your wife or your husband to understand what you are saying. These words of affirmation include simple words like I love you, simple words like I'm sorry, simple words like um, thank you. When you show that you are happy with them, when you show, when you see, you say out in your words, words of appreciation. When you do something for you, you say thank you. It shows that um, it's, it's a word of affirmation. And then it's physical touching. And then um, this is perhaps um, one of the ones that many of us will be able to relate with a lot. But this is a way of communicating. It's an emotional way of communicating between between couples. Um, it's um, communicating love as we are called a love language. It includes holding hands, couples are encouraged, married couples are encouraged to hold hands, kissing, pecking, embracing themselves, patting themselves on the back, sitting close to each other. It shows that, yes, um, it shows that the two are close and we encourage this, uh, this type of love language. 
Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much, yeah. Pastor Lee. Yeah. We've seen five love uh, languages, and uh, we know that even by the uh, experts that are specialized in marriage and uh, love life, they don't dispute any of these languages. Rather, it's part of the core values, core tools that they use in counseling purpose to stay together, to be together, to be happy together. So we've established today also that these are also biblical and we should practice it. We should give our time to each other. We should deliver an act of service. We should give gifts. We should give words and evaluation. And uh, we should keep in touch physically. We should be together and enjoy each other. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, let's quickly look at our class activity one. Why are many marriages not following or based on God's principle? Um, we might not be able to take a feedback from home, but we are going to discuss it here so that we all benefited from it. Why are many marriages? Well, the very first point I'm going to raise before I open the floor for Pastor Lee to to contribute is the fact that a lot of people don't take marriage to God anymore in this generation. A lot of people happy their ways and like God understands. A lot of, to put it in a milder word, a lot of marriage has been done for compromise. Compromise on a number of things caused by a number of things. Now, the ultimate thing is that as believers, as a child of God. Because we are going on a journey of eternity on earth. Permit me to use that word in quotes. Because marriage is actually a journey of eternity on earth. Meaning that until you leave this earth, you are going to be in that relationship. We should not look at a short term event around us to take decision for a long time. Rather, we should contact the master. We should go to God. When we go to God, Definitely, we learn all these principles. And when we learn all these principles, we set up a very good base for us to live a good life for the rest of our life in a blossom and happy marriage. Pastor Lee, over to you. Well, I'm just um, saying we should look at just, I've just mentioned two or three things that I think um, why many marriages are not, um, are not following the rules. First, people were encouraged that. Couples, you should ensure that you should not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. These days, you see many people getting married that, and they know that their the spouse is not a believer. Correct. And once that is once that happens, the foundation has a bit has a bit of a problem. If you don't, if your spouse does not believe in what you believe in, it is not the same thing that that uh, it is not the same set of rules of laws that you want to walk towards, then there's a, there's a problem there. Then secondly, like you have said, it is when they don't go to God, when they don't use biblical principles. For example, all of these that we have just read are biblical principles for the marriage to be good. So when they don't use biblical principles to, um, to guide themselves in marriage, it causes, it causes a, big, a, a big problem. And I think these are the major issues that we need to uh, always understand. Thanks so much, sir. As we are about rounding off, the summary of it today is that the biblical principle and love languages strengthen marital relationship. Couples should discover and express to each other what their primary love language is and not just speak or do what your langu love language is. We encourage couples to be intimate, to explore, know the best language that your spouse responds to. And we pray that God will give us a blissful home in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like Pastor Lee to pray to close this Sunday school. Father, we want to thank you. Father, we bless you all in the name of Lord. The institution of marriage was put in place by you. And you are the one that knows what people need to do in order to be able to enjoy marriage. Marriage is supposed to be enjoyed and not endured. Father, we pray even as your word has taught us that you will teach us, you will give us the grace to do that, to put in place, to go by the principles 
with which our marriage will be enjoyed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. I also want to use the opportunity to pray for those who are looking up to you for marriage, that you will grant them this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that your word will continue to guide us. I uh, will not just be here as of your word, we will also be to us of your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us. Please join us for the second service. We're starting. I'm the king, Isiaka. Thank you for joining us.